Well, as I was preparing for the message this morning, I had an idea about uh, how I was going to introduce our topic for this morning. And uh, then something happened that uh, totally changed my mind. Uh, yesterday, there was an assassination attempt on a candidate for President of the United States. And um, it just so happens that the passage that we're looking at this morning uh, specifically has to do with an ongoing uh, assassination attempt uh, against a future king of Israel. And so um, it's amazing that uh, the times that we're living in now, in some ways, are not so different from the times uh, that we study in the Scripture. And so, in the Scripture today, we're actually going to be looking at 1 Samuel chapter 19, verse 1, to 1 Samuel chapter 27, verse 4. So that is more than eight chapters. And so as you may guess, I'm not going to read it all for you this morning. And uh, instead, I'm going to summarize the content of those eight plus chapters for you. And then I'm going to talk a little bit about what it means for us as followers of Jesus Christ. Now, last week, uh, Mark told us about uh, the incident of David when he met Goliath in battle and killed him. And uh, God used a young shepherd boy who was anointed to someday be king of Israel in order to deliver his people from their enemies. And that event made David very popular. And in the days that followed, uh, King Saul began to give David more and more responsibility, and he was leading the armies of Israel out in battle, and he was having great success against the Philippines, and he became more and more and more popular. Until finally, when uh, Saul and David would come into town. They'd have people that would come out and meet them with singing and tambourines, and, and they would sing, Saul has slain his thousands, and David his ten thousands. And Saul didn't like that very much. It made him jealous. And as time went on and people kept singing that, Saul got more and more jealous. And after a while, he began to perceive it as a threat to his rule. That if people like David so much, then they're going to knock me off and they're going to put David on the throne instead of me. And so uh, David is a threat to my rule and he needs to be eliminated. And so there were a number of times when Saul directly attempted to kill David himself. Uh, David, he would have uh, be playing the harp for him, and he picked up his spear and he threw it at David and missed. And that happened on a couple of different occasions. And uh, he finally decided, well, I guess I don't throw the spear straight enough to get rid of this guy. And so he started talking to his other servants and, hey, uh, can one of you kill David for me? And, of course, no one was anxious to go against the guy who killed Goliath. And, and so, uh, but he kept asking. And uh, finally, David realized he wasn't safe in Israel anymore. And so... He fled. And um, so if you can put up slide number one, David. David headed for Gath. And uh, David actually had been up here. This is the area of Judah um, 
the tribe of Judah lived in the south of the nation of Israel. And uh, Saul's uh, seat of power was up here in Gibeah of Saul. And so Saul headed from up here above the map and he headed down to Gath. And the reason that David headed for Gath is it was a Philistine-controlled city. And you know, the uh, uh, enemy of my enemy is my friend. And, and so uh, Saul had become his enemy and the Philistines were Saul's enemies. So maybe they would be his friend. I mean, if he could flee to Gath, then maybe he'd be safe there. It was a place where Saul couldn't get him. And so he went there. But even though David was in trouble with Saul, the Philistines didn't know that David was in trouble with Saul. And so they had heard the song too. They had heard Saul has killed his thousands and David has killed his ten thousands. And those thousands and those, <clears throat> excuse me, ten thousands, they were all Philistines. And so it's like, wow, we've got this guy who is the major general for the Israelites here in Gath. Uh, we can make him a prisoner. We can kill him. Uh, and so they were kind of thinking about what they were going to do with David. And so David was in deep trouble, and so he pretended to be insane. And he uh, drooled in his beard, and he scratched little figures on the doorposts, and, and after a while they decided, either this isn't David, or David isn't any threat, but we don't need any nuts around here, and they drove him out of town. And so David ran away, and then we can go to slide two, and he fled from Gath to the area of Adullam, where there were a bunch of caves. And uh, at this point, David's relatives said, you know, Saul is trying to kill David because they think he's a traitor, and uh, they might decide to try to get at David by killing us, or they might think we're traitors as well. And so David's relatives fled to Adullam as well. And uh, other people that were in trouble fled to David at Adullam. And also other people who were troublemakers fled to David at Adullam. And so after a while, David had a band of 400 misfits uh, that he was in charge of in the area of Adullam. Well, when David's relatives fled to him at Adullam, that included his aging parents. And he knew that if he had to run with Saul, if he had to move really quickly, you know, he couldn't put them in a car and drive them away. Uh, they had to walk or ride a donkey or something, and they were going to slow him down and maybe get him killed. And so if we can go to slide number three, he went from Adullam to the area of Moab, which was just on the other side of the Dead Sea, uh, from Israel, and uh, he left his parents there in Moab. You may remember that David's great-grandmother had been a Moabite, Ruth, and so he had family in the area, and so he took his aging parents to a place where they would be safe while Saul was trying to hunt him down. Well, while David was in Moab, a prophet by the name of Gad came to him, and he said, you need to uh, return to Judah. And so if we can go to the next slide, uh, David traveled from Moab in obedience to God's command and he went to the forests of Hereth. And uh, he was in that area. And while David was hiding out in the forest of Hereth, Saul found something out. And what Saul found out is that when David had flown, uh, fled from uh, Gibeah of Saul down to Gath, he had passed through a city right about here in the territory of Benjamin on the border of Judah that was called Nob. And the city of Nob was where the high priests and the priests all lived. And so it was the priestly city. And when David had passed through Nob, he had received assistance from the priests. And uh, the priests hadn't known that David was in trouble with Saul. They thought he was, you know, the major general of the Israelite army, and so they were helping him out. But uh, nonetheless, Saul found out that David had passed through Nob, 
and uh, he got really angry about it. And uh, he didn't pay any attention to the fact that they didn't know uh, that David was in trouble with him. And so Saul went there, and he killed every man, woman, and child in the city of Nob. With the exception of one, there was uh, one of the sons of the high priest, and his name was Abiathar, and he managed to get away. And as he fled, he took a part of the high priestly garment called the ephod with him. And uh, the ephod was an elaborately woven linen apron made with gold, blue, purple, and scarlet thread. And there was an elaborately jeweled uh, chest covering that was attached to the ephod. And that uh, chest covering contained something called the urim and thumim. And those objects enabled the high priest to seek counsel from God uh, and find out what his direction was for the people of Israel. And so Abiathar fled from Saul and he fled to David uh, in the forest of Hereth and he brought the ephod along with him. And so David was now in the forest of Hereth and he had a way to inquire of God and receive his direction as he needed to make decisions. And so um, then we can go to the next slide. So David was here in the forest of Hereth and he heard that the Philistines were coming from over here and they were attacking the city of Kila. And so now that he had the opportunity to seek counsel with God, he said to God, should I, should I go to Kila and help the people there uh, to help defend them against the Philistines. And God said, yes, you should. So David traveled to Kila with his 400 misfits, and he beat off the Philistines, and, and they went away. And uh, so then, uh, if we can go to the next slide, Saul heard that David was in Kila, and he said, oh, good, I know where David is. And he took the whole Israelite army, and he decided he was going to head for Kila and get David there. And so David consulted again uh, with God uh, using the ephod. And uh, he said, you know, should, is, is Saul going to come here? And if he comes, are the people of Kila going to give me over to Saul? And God said, yes, Saul is going to come. And if you stay here, the people of Kila are going to give you into Saul's hands. And so David fled from Kila, and he fled down to the area of Ziph. Now, uh, when he got to Ziph, the people of Ziph contacted Saul, and they said, hey, David's here. If you want, we'll show you where he's hiding so you can come and kill him. And so... If you'd like to go to the next slide, uh, Saul came towards Ziph, and so uh, David uh, fled down to the wilderness of Maon, and uh, as he is fleeing from Saul into the wilderness of Maon, there's only one hill between him and Saul. Saul is almost ready to catch up with David and kill him. And then a messenger comes and says, hey, the Philistines have invaded Israel. And so Saul says, well, do I chase David? Do I fight the Philistines? Do I chase David? Do I fight the Philistines? And he decided to fight the Philistines. And so he turned around and went off to fight the Philistines. And so David was able to get away from Saul. Well, we can go to the next slide. And so Saul says, I, or David said, I haven't been having very good luck in this area. I think I'll go over to En Gedi uh, by the Dead Sea, and I'll hide out there. And so David fled to the strongholds of En Gedi, and after Saul was done fighting the Philistines, he headed for En Gedi too. And... Uh, while Saul was in En Gedi, 
he went into a cave. Um, the Hebrew says that Saul went into the cave to cover his feet. Um, there's two possible meanings to that. Uh, one is that he went into the cave to take a nap. And the other possible meaning is he went into the cave to rest in the way that we rest in a restroom. And so uh, it means one of those two things. So Saul went into this cave to cover his feet. And uh, what he doesn't know is David and his men are hiding in the darkness in the back of the cave. And so Saul comes into the cave and he covers his feet. And David takes a knife and he goes over to Saul and he raises the knife and he cuts off a corner of Saul's robe and then he goes back and hides in the corner of the cave. And so after Saul is done covering his feet, he goes out of the cave and David goes out of the cave and he says, why are you chasing me? You can see here I have in my hand a corner of your robe. If I was a threat to you, I could have cut your throat instead of your robe, and you'd be dead right now. Why do you keep chasing me? And Saul said, you know, you're right. I can see that you're not a threat to me. And so Saul turned around, and he went home. Well, David had had experience with Saul changing his mind before, and so he didn't stick around in Getty where he thought maybe Saul would come back. And so if you want to go to the next slide, he fled down to the wilderness of Paran, and uh, he and his men were hiding there. And while they were in the wilderness of Paran, they served to help protect the inhabitants that lived there from the bandits that had been plaguing the area. Uh, you know, the Philistines would come over and raid the area and um, uh, just regular Israelite scum would raid the area and there were all these pagan nations surrounding them and they'd send bands and they'd raid the area. And so Saul and his men were protecting this area of Paran. And uh, they would do it, you know, they did it through the heat of summer, they did it through the cold of winter. Um, and they just uh, were enduring uh, harsh conditions in order to, to protect the inhabitants of Paran. And so the day came where one of the richest guys in Paran had been shearing his sheep, and he threw a big party. And so David said, well, you know, hey, this guy is throwing a big party. Uh, maybe he can share some of what uh, he... Um, some of the extra food that he has, you know, some of his leftovers, maybe he can share with my band of merry men and uh, we'll have something to eat. And so uh, David sent some messengers to this guy. His name was Nabal. And he said, hey, you know, uh, you're having a party. Is there anything you can spare for me and my men? And uh, Nabal insulted David. He said, why should I take my food and give it to some runaway slave. And so the messengers came back and they told David, hey, uh, Nabal says, why should he take his food and give it to some runaway slave? And David said, here I've been protecting this guy and everything he has and all he can do is insult me. I've had enough. Everybody, put on your swords. And so they put on their swords and David headed for Nabal's house and he was planning to kill all the men. But while he was on the way, Nabal's wife heard what had happened. And uh, Nabal's wife, Abigail, was a lot smarter than Nabal. And she thought, you know, you don't want to insult a guy that's got a band of 400 men that are protecting us from bandits. Um, if he loses his temper, it might not be a good thing. And so she loaded up a bunch of food on some donkeys, and she rode off to meet David. 
And when she met him, she said, hey, I'm really sorry, my husband's such a jerk. Um, here's some food for you, and uh, please, please don't do anything that you'll regret later. And David said, I'm grateful to God that he sent you, so I didn't do something stupid as well. And uh, so David turned around, and he didn't kill anybody. And uh, when Nabal's wife Abigail got back, Nabal was still partying, and he was pretty drunk. Uh, so she didn't say anything to him till the next day, uh, at which point she told him what had happened. And Nabal was so overcome by it that he had a stroke, and uh, he was just basically like a rock for about a week and then died. And uh, so David heard that Nabal had died, and he was pretty impressed with Abigail. And so he proposed to her, and she accepted, and David and Abigail got married. So, well, in the meantime, or not in the meantime, but soon after this, Saul changed his mind and started chasing David again. And so if we can have the next slide, David happened to go back up to Ziph. I'm not sure why David went back up to Ziph, because the first time he was there, they said, hey, we'll tell Saul where you are. And uh, they did the same thing the second time he was up in that area. And so they said, hey, we're going to tell Saul where you are. And so Saul and his whole army came and they were camped out in the field, and night came, and uh, David and his men were on a mountain nearby. And David saw all the campfires down there, and he said, hey, anybody want to go with me and sneak down into the camp and see what we can do? And uh, one other guy said, yeah, I'll go with you. And so David and this other guy snuck into the camp, and everybody was asleep. And they came right up to Saul's bedside, and he had a spear stuck in the ground there, and he had a jug of water. And the guy that was with David said, hey, this is your big chance. Just take the spear, stick it through him, and he won't chase you anymore. And David said, no, I can't do that. He is the Lord's anointed. And so he took the spear, and he took the jug of water, and they went, and they went back on the mountainside, up on the mountain, across from where is the Israelite army was camped out, and uh, Saul's general was named Abner. He said, uh, hey, Abner, wake up. I'm paraphrasing a little bit here. Uh, and Abner says, who's calling out to the king? And uh, David said, you know, Abner, uh, you are charged with protecting the king's life, and in the event that you fail, the penalty is death. That's real motivation for the Secret Service to prevent assassinations that, you know, if uh, the king gets killed, then the royal guard gets killed. And so he says, Abner, you deserve to die because uh, some people came into the camp to harm the king and you slept right through it. And uh, Saul said, is that your voice, David? And uh, David said, yep, it's me. While you were sleeping down there, I came, I got your spear, I got your jug of water. You can see I have them right here. Now... I've said this before, but I'm saying it again. If I wanted to kill you, you'd be dead. But I don't want to kill you. And so stop chasing me. And uh, Saul said, you're right. Uh, you're more righteous than I am. Uh, I've been foolish by chasing you, and I promise I won't chase you anymore. And uh, Saul gave the spear and the jug of water to someone and brought it back to Saul. And Saul went back up to Gibeah of Saul, and uh, David then, uh, if we can go to the next slide, went back to Gath, from Ziph up to Gath. Now, as I said before, Gath is a Philistine city, but by this time, David's been on the run, on the run long enough that the Philistines know that he's not Israel's major general, that Saul wants to kill him. And they're going from the theory, hey, the enemy of my enemy is my friend. And so they say, okay, David, you can come here. You and your people uh, can live here, and uh, we're going to protect you. And so for the rest of the time that Saul was alive, then David and his people that were with him uh, lived in the territory of Gath. 
And so uh, that is a summary of what happened while David was on the run from Saul. But the question is, what does all of that mean for us? And so uh, if we can go to the next slide. This is a famous road in Norway. This road is called the Troll's Path. And um, in some ways, uh, this particular road can kind of be a picture of David's life. Because, uh, you know, David was anointed as king and he killed Goliath and he probably thought, well, you know, God's leading me in this direction and he wants me to go over there and so I'll probably get more and more responsibility and, um, uh, you know, I I'm, I'm married the king's daughter and, and uh, I'm his son-in-law and, and uh, I'll just keep uh, serving Saul and serving Saul and serving Saul and getting more and more responsibility and, and someday uh, Saul will become old and he will die of old age or, or maybe he'll be killed in battle with the Philistines, I don't know, but someday God in his timing is uh, going to have Saul not be king anymore and uh, so when that happens he'll take me to be king. And uh, that's kind of how David probably imagined everything was going to go. Uh, but uh, David didn't imagine that the road was going to bring him to Gath and that then it was going to take him to Moab and that then it was going to take him to Hereth and that then it was going to take him to Kila and that then it was going to take him to Maon and then it was going to take him to En Gedi and then it was going to take him to Paran and and uh, then it was going to take him back to Ziph, and uh, then it's going to take him back to Gath, and eventually it's going to take him to be king of Israel. He didn't know that there were going to be all these unpleasant twists and turns on his journey to be king of Israel. And uh, in our lives, as we set out to follow Jesus Christ, sometimes we might imagine, well, you know, uh, I'm going to follow Jesus, and and, um, you know, he's leading me in this particular direction, and so he's going to keep leading me in this direction, and, and I'm just going to keep following, and, and things are going to be fine, and, and uh, it's going to be a, a, a smooth cruise. And um, we don't realize that sometimes God's leading us to point A so he can lead us to point B, so he can lead us to point C, so he can lead us to point D, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera and uh, points B, C, D, E, F, G, or whatever may or may not be pleasant points in our journey. So in John 16, 33, the first part of the verse, Jesus said to us that in this world you will have trouble. And in 2 Timothy 3, 2, uh, God's where it tells us that those who wish to live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. And so as we go through life, uh, we often experience unexpected hardships along the way. It's part of living in a sin-cursed fallen world. Unpleasant things happen, uh, very, very unpleasant things happen, things that uh, throw us for a loop, um, things that break our hearts, um, bad things happen. But in the second part of John 16, 33, Jesus tells us, uh, but be not dismayed because I've overcome the world. And so no matter what trials or tribulations we may experience in this life as we follow Jesus Christ, and we will experience trials and tribulations, but no matter what they are, we can be confident that he will lead us and guide us and carry us through those tribulations and that we will someday come safely home to the place that he's preparing for us. So in Galatians 6, 9, God's word tells us, but be not weary in well-doing. For in due season you will reap if you do not faint. 
And so my encouragement to you today is um, let's learn from God's example in the life of King David and know that no matter what hardships we may experience along the way, that God's plan for us will not be frustrated and that we should continue to follow faithfully step by step until he brings us to the place that he's prepared for us. And that's uh, what I wanted to share today from the life of King David. Let's pray. Ah, Heavenly Father, we live in a sin-cursed, fallen world full of sorrow, full of trial and tribulation. And yet, Lord, none of it's any surprise to you that your son, Jesus Christ, while he was here on earth, experienced the full measure of sorrow and suffering, even to the point of death on the cross, because of the joy that was set before him. And Lord, you raised him again from the dead and seated him at your right hand, and someday soon he's coming again to receive us unto himself, to reign in glory. And so, Lord, let us find our sustenance, our support, our comfort, our strength in you as we face the trials of daily life. I pray in the name of your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.